Hey, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, glad, glad to be able to talk again because uh, it was like seven months ago we spoke about your your last film, and I was very well behaved and like worked in at the very end, like so, just throwing it out there, spiral, and uh, it's now. good. To be, it's good to be able to finally talk about it after having to sit on it for a year plus and not be able to really say anything. Yeah, that's got to be weird too because I know you know it's not the first rodeo, so you know what you did. You you know you yeah. rap. And I'm sure you probably had a pretty good feeling about it, but the year of nothing, I'm sure at some point you're like, oh God, people are going to wait for this. Then it's going to suck. And then everyone's going to be mad at me. Then all that, like just the, you know, uh, yeah, the thing we have. Not only, not only the having to wait, but then you got to think about how many people had copies of the movie. So you're looking at post houses, publicity houses, uh, the studio. And so what that meant is it left that much more time for it to be circulated online, which luckily it has not. But there's always that fear as well that, you know, we're going to wait a year and then it's going to end up on, you know, the front page of Reddit, download the entire movie. Yeah. Uh, so you had that to deal with. Then you had just the anxiety of I wanted people to see it. I was I was happy. I was excited. And then you have to wait, you know, a year plus as the world is going through probably one of the most horrific and tragic, you know, 18 months. Um, so it's uh, it's crazy. It's, it's good to finally be here, though. Yeah, no, it's it's wild that it didn't happen, which is right. One good that people don't do it but i know it was always a a problem with horror movies especially i don't know that i don't know that saw ever had that problem in terms of like the box office i think people you know pirated it but it still made money i know i think it was like maybe the hostile sequel got just yeah. destroyed because i think when i spoke to eli roth once upon a time he was like you know listen people you know i can't be mad because like it's life but the amount of people who supposedly downloaded it that weekend was more than if they bought a ticket how many people bought a ticket like we should have been a hit well, I've I've had a a, a a very intense past with with like bitching about torrent sites. I've kind of as I've gotten older, I've kind of given up on it because there's, yeah. you know what, it, it it's fine. It's people are going to do what they're going to do. What what does make me mad though is I've had a couple of movies that my director's cut got out, and people yeah. reviewed the movie off the director's cut, as opposed to the finest the the the, the final movie that was mixed and sound designed. That pisses me off because there's the movie goes through so many stages and the polish that gets put on at the end when Charlie Clauser's score gets put in or when you put in the, the color or the visual effects, that's the true movie. So I care less about the pirating than I do people watching the movie correctly and the right version of it. But what are yeah. you going to do? Exactly. Yeah. Once in a while, I've, I've, I've seen a you know not complete cut as like, we're showing it to you early. Just keep this in mind. We'd love yeah. you to see it again. But you know, we want you to, you know, have what you need early. And, and yeah, you can, you can definitely tell the filmmaker's intent. Like, I think a good movie is a good movie. But yeah. yeah. There's definitely a difference between like, oh, that looks a little like rickety. Oh, it's because, you know, there's still $3 million to come in this project. Like, it's not, it's not ready yet. Um, but for, for this, I remember when I, when I asked you about it, you were just like, Chris Rock, that's why I'm back. And yeah. now that I've seen it, I'm like, oh, that makes complete sense because it's, you know, I don't know. I'm sure you get this a lot that people who like the franchise will like tell you like, oh, my God, what if you did this or what if you did that? And most of our ideas are terrible. Like, let's be real. We, you know, fans yeah. necessarily don't make movies for a reason. You know, I've been that way. I'm like, I wonder if they're going to do this next time. They never do. And it's probably for the best. But it's wild that he, you know, was kind of that way. I gotta love these movies. What if you made this type of movie? And and honestly, I think it's the best one yet, which is thank you. Wild praise. Um yeah, I mean, I appreciate that so much. Um, you know, when Chris, first off, Chris Rock, in my opinion, is is probably one of the greatest living comedians of, yeah. of our time. And so when he talks, you listen. Uh, that doesn't mean that everything he says is 100% right, but you listen to him and you give him that respect. That this guy, this guy has a voice. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hearing kind of his take on, on Saw and Spiral, I was just like, that makes complete sense. And he, you know, he said out, he goes, I, it's, I don't want to make a comedy. He goes, I do not want to make a comedy. I want to make a movie that is a Saw movie with a little bit of humor. He goes, it's a little bit. Uh, and he, he likened it to 48 Hours, which I think is a great reference because I had forgotten about 48 Hours, the tone of it, until I went back and rewatched it. I guess in my mind, I thought oh, it's a cop comedy. No, it's not. It's a hard-edged, intense, fuck you, violent movie that has Eddie Murphy in it doing some jokes. Yeah. And so when Eddie Murphy's on screen, it's a little bit humorous, but when you're with Nick Nolte or any of the, the, the you know, the violence, it's not. 
And so watching, you know, we kind of went off saying, okay, what if we mixed seven meets 48 hours? And that was kind of what we went into. And I think that we were able to pull that off. Um, you, you, I think when you watch it, you'll see it's got that buddy cop thing to it, but it also is a Saw movie. It's got that hard edge side to it as well. Yeah, it, it, I, the press notes summed it up really well. I read them going in to see it. It was my first theatrical experience in 14 months. So it's great. I came for you. Um, they, he, I think he said something along the lines of, you know, there was a scene in Saw 2 where, where Donnie Wahlberg's talking to his partner. And like, um, it just, if there was a joke right in the middle of that, everyone would take a breath and then you could build up again. And he's something along the lines of like, you know, in comedy, you know, you use a joke as like a beat. In horror, you use a jump scare, you use blood, you use whatever. And and this movie does a great job of it. Like even just little, little things like Max Mignello, like not getting to go in a door. And like, all yeah. right, I'll stand outside. Like, it's just, it's a, you smile for a second at a moment where you're, you're starting to get intense. Yeah. You know, Chris was, um, he was really uh, in tune with the tone going through every scene. And I, there were a few scenes that we shot, great dramatic scenes where Chris would come back the next day and he's like, you know what? It was too serious. We got to do that again. And I'm like, Chris, it was awesome. He goes, let me do it one more time. Hmm. So we shoot it again. And then he just had a singular joke into it and it made all the difference in the world. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example. There's a scene in the movie early on in the first act where um, he's up, he finds out confirmation that Boz is dead. And there's, he had this, he had this two and a half page monologue where he's yelling at everyone, basically saying, fuck you. He was my friend. He was this. And there's a, uh, there was, so he does that scene and then he finds out that he's going to get the case and he comes back in and it was supposed to be a serious moment and he does it seriously. He's like, no, let's do it again. Comes back and goes, I know some of you are mad. Some of you are hate me. Some of you are still angry. I fucked your mother. And like that one fucked your mother thing causes such a laugh in the audience. And it's great because I got to see it live uh, a year ago in Las Vegas at a test screening. And you would hear the audience go utter silence, laughter, utter silence. And it was awesome because you knew you had them at that moment. Like they were going on that ride. So, so Chris was just fantastic about finding those moments of levity amongst all that torture and pain. And it's, and it's hard to do. I mean, we, you know, we watch a lot of horror movies. Like there are plenty that the jokes seem either shoved in or there's too many. Like even like, I'm, I'm going to say like the, the Forrest Gump joke, and I won't say what it is. because I want people to hear it is one of the funniest things I've heard in a year. Like it would fit in a broad comedy. It's amazing. It's a great joke. You know, that wasn't even in the script. Uh, Chris came to me. We were already filming. I think we were in the first week of filming. And he comes to me and goes, I goes, I don't know about my introduction. And I was like, what's wrong? And I think he was originally introduced uh, in a pot store. Like, I think he was, I, I might be making this up, but I think he was buying pot. And then he arrested someone right when they got out. So like, it was like, you, you met this kind of unique character. And he was just like, mm. he's like, it's too weak. And he's like, I got to do something better than that. And I said, what? And he goes, I don't know. I'm going to go home and think about it comes back the next day and hands me these four pages of the Forrest Gump monologue. And I was like, oh my God, this is awesome. And what's great about it, what I, what I love about it, and uh, is that Chris, he isn't saying it as a joke, he's saying it in character. So it's yeah. his character doing this thing, it just happens to be fucking hilarious. There's, uh, yeah, he, the character is, is maybe the best, as, I mean, John's always gonna yeah. be the best character because he's- yeah. Exactly, he's John Kramer. Yeah. yeah, but in terms of like a three-dimensional, like real movie character you could pull out and put in a different movie, yeah, he, he's fully formed. And yeah, his his bitterness and, and like anger at the world manifests itself into dark humor. And that's way more relatable, I think, than, you know, a lot of times, and for better or worse, like, listen, I love every Saw movie, but some are closer to guilty pleasures than others. Yeah, of course. You know, you're, you're kind of following the guy because you know you're following the guy, okay? And he's angry about the thing. You know you got to follow him. You know, it was towards the end, it became more about the metaphor for the traps or yeah. about mythology as opposed to, here's a new character, get to know him. You didn't, because you also were like, he's not going to be around. Like, we know how this works. So this being like everyone in the movie, really, you 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 could pluck them out and put them in, in seven and it would fit. You could pluck them out and put them in 48 hours, it would fit. It just happens to be that some of them will get murdered and tortured. Exactly. Uh, you know, and I, 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 I think that Saw needed that, I don't want to call it, I mean, it's not a reboot. It's not, it's not a sequel. It's its own thing. It's a standalone movie. But I think that it needed this Chris Rock kind of touch, which is um, not only the comedy, but let's say the first eight films, I watched a couple of them the last couple of days. I was doing this tweet-a-thon thing. I was, I was reading along. Uh, 
and I haven't seen these in, in so long, and they're fucking complicated and dense and interwoven with mythology that if you miss one of the movies, you're kind of not going to get the same thing out of the next one you see. Um, and I think there needed to be that reset button for the audience to basically say, it's okay if you haven't seen Saw 1 through 8. You don't need to. This is its own thing. No. And so, you know, we, we have Easter eggs. You know, if, if you were a fan of the Saw franchise, there's a lot to find in this movie that connects to it. But you don't need to have seen any other films to come in and, and see this one and enjoy this one. No, I, I think if you've seen them, I, almost every one of the prior films has something represented along the way. Sometimes yeah. it's just maybe me going, is that kind of like? But yeah, you could not have seen everything. They give you enough. They give like, oh, so the Jigsaw Killer, and you get the gist. But yeah, it's there's something about, you know, we, we may have taken this idea as far as we can without pivoting in some way. And like you said, it's not a sequel, but it's in the world. You know, it's the next movie, however you want to look at that. And well, what, what I'm saying, and again, this is me saying it without talking to the producers, and I might get in trouble for this, but... Huh. You know, this is not Saw 9. It's the ninth no. installment of the Saw franchise. But, you know, if this is successful and they keep making them, you could see a traditional Saw 9 that follows, you know, the Logan character, the Hoffman character, bringing back John Kramer. Or you might see a Spiral 2. Or they might exist simultaneously at the exact same time, which I think is what's exciting about this. You know, you're getting into that whole thing with The Conjuring did, which is, you know, you have The Conjuring, you have Annabelle, you have all of these movies that exist simultaneously to one another. Yeah, when you when you have a mythology like that, you have the ability, if you do it right, to go off on these strands and, and treat it like a, you know, a full on universe. And what makes this one, I think, really interesting is that it's a combination of, you know, Chris Rock, very new voice to the idea of Saw, doing things that we've never seen in the movie uh, franchise, but having the guys who wrote the last movie on and then having you, who who's the most frequent director of the franchise, you know, and but even at the same time, it doesn't look like two, three and four. You know, it doesn't no. even look like anything else you've made. No, and I think one of the one of the things when I came back on, one of the very first things is is I said that as much as I loved uh, working with um, David uh, Armstrong, who was the original cinematographer, I said we had to go we had to go different on this one. Um, I think that I wanted this to have a younger, fresher look. Uh, and so this is a this is a crazy story. I was sitting in my office, and we did not have a DP on. And I am looking, I have a, a, a playlist, a YouTube playlist of just my favorite music videos. And I literally looked up uh, and it was a Drake video for God's plan. And I just love the video. I love the way it was shot. And I was like, who is the DP of this? And ironically, just complete happenstance, he happened to be a Canadian DP living two blocks from the soundstage that we were at. And I was like, someone get this guy in here right now. So the DP, Jordan Oram, came in. I met with him. Immediately we hit it off. Uh, and so, you know, he's a young guy, uh, and he just brought this fresh style. I think the first thing that we talked about was I didn't love the way Jigsaw looked. It was so polished and pretty, and it, it looked like almost like a CW version of Saw. Yeah. Uh, I said that I wanted to bring it back more gritty, but I didn't necessarily want to go back to that green, whatever. And I said, what if it takes place on the hottest week of the summer? And you've seen that in movies before. I mean, Spike Lee's been a, a big person that's done that. Um, but I was also at the time watching Angel Heart a lot. Uh, and if you watch Angel Heart, every character looks like they're just drenched in sweat. They have sweat stains, pit stains. Uh, and I just love that feel. So we, we gave it this kind of hot look. Um, everyone walked around sweating profusely. Uh, it was, uh, it just became the new kind of look of what Spiral would be. Yeah, and like taking place in the daytime, all these little things that, you know, isn't inherently making anything better but when you watch it you go okay this is what i didn't get and i want because that's the thing you so many of the of the of the big sequences you think of are in a dingy this or a crappy that or you know yeah. even being outdoors is very rare in the in the franchise you know jigsaw did a little bit of that but like you yeah. said it also looked like just a horror movie and yeah. i didn't dislike it because i like jig i like saw so I, I was in but yeah there's something about this going no, this is grabbing you and going, you're watching a film like beforehand. This isn't. Well, I, also think, I also think the minute you see Samuel L. Jackson or Max Minghella or Chris Rock, you know, you're in a different version of Saw because yeah. I've always loved the cast that we've had. They've all fit, but this is elevated to a different level. When you have these type of people in the film, you, 
I think you watch the movie differently and it just feels bigger. I mean, the first month, you know, Samuel Jackson's very first line that he said on set when he came to, to do his first day on set was motherfucker. And it was when he throws the glass against the wall and says, motherfucker. And I was like, yep, this is going to be big. Like this yeah. is, uh, so yeah, it, the whole, the whole experience of shooting it, of now watching the reactions for it has just been completely surreal. Yeah. It's, what's interesting also in that one, you said yes, because you obviously didn't have to, you know, this is what no one put a gun to your head, but that, you know, you've now done sort of every version of Saw, you know, Saw 2 is, is very much based on something you wrote. It's the beginnings of stretching out the, the mythology. And by the time you did four, like you said, like if you hadn't seen them, you, you can't start with Saw 4. You'd be kind of lost. And now you can watch without. How is it different when you're, you know, especially at four, when you're, when you're going, okay, I'm, I'm basically making six movies at once, sort of. I'm tying, people are going to use pieces of this going forward. And, and this is much more of a, a fresh start. Yeah, I mean, I think that I felt as much pressure on this movie as I did on the very first movie I directed, which is Saw 2. Yeah. And the way I thought it would have been easier, it wasn't. I, I think because I always equate it to Blackjack, and it's ironic that I keep playing with cards as I'm telling you this. But, right. um, you, you know, I felt like with Saw 2, I went to Blackjack, I, I went to the table, and I put everything I had on one hand, and I got 21. I got the Blackjack, and I should have walked away. I should have said, that's it. But I didn't. I doubled down. So now I double the money on my second hand and I'm like, holy shit, that's, that's more than I've ever seen in my life. And I, I don't mean money because I didn't make that much money doing them. But I just meant I should have walked away and I didn't. So Saw 4 comes out, it's number one again. And I was like, I've got to walk away. I can't, I, I, I got to end on top. I can't fuck with yeah. this. Um, so, it, you know, you're taking a decade plus break, coming back, it felt like, again, I put everything back on the, the table. Every, but plus the other 15 years of my life. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there was so much to live up to from uh, fan expectation, uh, you know, working with Chris and Sam, knowing their reputations, um, me being gone. There was so much. And then I also knew that every decision that was being made in that film would inevitably affect everything that came after it, um, which is what they all do. You know, when we were doing Saw 2 and 3 and 4, we were planting seeds that we knew would, would pay off in later films. So, you know, from the, the way we were going to make that look to the, the voice of the serial killer to the new pig thing, we knew that everything that we were doing would have an, a, a domino effect five years down the road. Right. So it just became, there was just an anxiety this time around that had not been there for a while. And I got to tell you, I feed off that. Like I feed off of that type of, that stress. Um, and, and, and I imagine it's all that experience in the, you know, you talked about the 15 years, we talked about it a little bit last time, you know, self-distributing, getting repo made, 11, 11, 11, like having good experiences, having bad experiences, having fights with, you know, people, um, and then getting into like immersive experiences and doing all these other things that aren't just one franchise. I have to imagine are, is a, it becomes a tool. You get back on set for this and as a, you already don't want to fall back into old habits, but you have all these other experiences to go, okay, I know what I want. I know what I don't want. I know, I think how to avoid doing this, you know, and I think yeah. we can make a good movie. Well, I'll tell you, the thing that I found most surprising this time around was, you know, I've made a lot of really small movies in the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, Death of Me was like a million dollars. So he, he, I always was looking forward to coming back to do a studio film because you feel like when you do a studio film, there's that safety blanket, that, that ability that you know that you're going to have the tool of the time, the budget. There is never enough tools and never enough budget because if I'm shooting death of me on 20 days, I always want 25. I'm like, I need five more days. Uh, in this movie, I had 40 days, but I needed 50. I was like, fuck, I just need 10 more days because you bring in more people. That means more crew. That means more time to set shots up. Yeah. That means, and so while the budget got bigger and the timing got bigger, the complexity of things got, got more and more intense as well. So I feel like, you know, as a filmmaker, you always want more. You wish you had more time. You wish you had more tools. Um, but, you know, one thing I love about Saw more so than any other franchise is the producers surround me with the best because I'm only as good as the people you surround me with. So, you know, I've made a bunch of really bad movies. I'm the same director in the bad movies I am the good. The difference is who they surround me with. Yeah. So one thing I love about the Spiral and the Saw franchise is they surround you with just amazing people, be it Chris Rock, or Rick Little Darling, the prop master. That's a name that people are be like, why is he talking about the prop master? 
because the prop master elevated the material by continually coming up with ideas about how to capture a person. Instead of using a needle, what if we used a cloth? Uh, you know, hey, Darren, here's an idea for the pig puppet. What if we did this? And that becomes those iconic things that fans will, you know, uh, you know, really pick apart. And it's so many different people are included in making this thing. Yeah. How do you how do you make sure that you like, obviously, with this, you want to make some new decisions and you want to change it up and you don't want it to feel too much like, like you said, a reboot, a sequel, any of that what what fear is there when you go okay we're going to the pig puppet as opposed to like billy you know we're changing up the voice obviously you don't want to it, it would be weird if you just had john's voice you'd have to really well, work around how that would be but when yeah. you when you make those choices like is there is there a moment where you go well if people hate this this is going to be a problem like because you're making a choice like it's a real choice yeah i mean it it was you know one of the things that i felt very strongly about from the very beginning as a fan of the franchise was no one can compete with Tobin. He is an impossibility. He is a he is on a level of his own. So the moment that you you remind the audience of Tobin's voice or his image or his presence, you are you are you are hurting the new thing you're trying to create. It would literally be like um, you know, if I go to a backyard grill and some guy's making steaks and I bring a steak from Ruth Chris's steakhouse, yeah. like you can't compete on on the the difference of this. So I didn't want to. I wanted to make sure that right off the bat, we took two of the most iconic things about Saw, which is Tobin Bell and the, and the puppet, the Billy doll, and said, let's remove those from the audience. Let's, let's get rid of that. Um, and I also then wanted to cast it completely different. Um, you know, it would have been easy to get a, a Tobin Bell lookalike copycat kind of thing. You had to go completely in a different direction. Um, and I think that what's so great about the person taking over in this one is he is such a fantastic actor. And we've only scratched the surface of what we want to do with him. In the same way that in Saw 1, you know, Tobin Bell laid on the floor the entire time. You only really got to know him for like 30 seconds, a minute. It wasn't until Saw 2 that you actually saw who he was. And that's the hope on this is that, you know, as we progress and do more films, you will understand who this killer really is. For sure. And, and, and the most since the first one, and maybe six, I think six is a really good like parable about healthcare. But yeah. you you once you understand the plan and there is a, you know, full on like, here's my plan, which I kind of love that yeah. you guys take the time to be like, no, let's have the guy explain his plan. Like, there's something fun about that. Like, and the movie knows what it's doing. Like, even Chris Rock at the time, you know, when you watch what's going on and you're like, OK, everyone is realizing what's going on at the same time. Yeah. And you realize that this person has a point like yeah. This is, this is something that is reflected in the real world. Like, wow. Like, I think that the best, the best killers or the best bad guys come from a moralistic dilemma that as an audience goer or viewer, you can kind of understand. You don't have to agree with them or their methods of how they do it, but you understand how we got to that point. Whether that's John Kramer or Hannibal Lecter, some of the best villains, uh, you know, you kind of get it. You're like, I get why you're doing this. I don't agree with how you're doing it, but I understand the method or reasoning to what got you here. Oh yeah, there's there that elevates it so much. And then without, you know, being very broad because people are first going to see it, like the very, the final death that you see is is harrowing because of what it is representing and, and how close it is to something else that you, you know, you yeah. can see on the news. And especially in a movie where you've had, you know, people murdered in in some of the more creative ways we've ever seen in the franchise which goes back to the prop master like the traps here don't look anything like the last ones they're not trying to be like the last ones but then what the final thing is is well being a trap is so rooted in like the tragedy of reality that you almost have to remind yourself you're watching a saw movie because this is this is like like we talked about spike lee that's angry in that same way uh i agree it's uh you know, I'm just excited for fans to see it. You know, it's, it's, it's for me, I just, I just want to get it out there. And I, you know, it's sitting on this thing for so long. It's been, it's been insane. And I think that it's a timely time, as you just said, for the movie to come out. It's, it's timely right now with the subject matter, what's going on with it. Um, so, you know, let's, uh, let's hope fans check it out this weekend and, and, and dig it. It really is all about that first weekend, specifically now and in, in a time of COVID where, you know, that, uh, box office matters uh and we're you're, we're dealing with a diminished capacity in theaters a lot of theater chains have closed you know so it's going to be an interesting next couple of days for sure i do think it's going to do real well though because it's also the first like event film really that's a horror film like if you wanted to go 
you know, be scared in a theater for, it's been, you know, over a year, if not longer for people to do it. And, you know, people, have, if ever you had a chance to revisit the series, like now's the time, you've had the time and, and just, we, you know, like we were saying, it's, it's, it didn't get less timely in the past year, which, you know, obviously I think we, you'd rather it not have been the case, but still like, you know, it's a movie that says something and what it's saying still is, is, is relevant. And, and, you know, I got to imagine that year is, is, is harrowing besides the whole, like, you know, I hope I don't die in the past year and I'm bored and all that stuff, you know, also I made a movie that I think is great. Why can't anyone see it? Uh, I agree. Yeah. Uh, and again, I thank you for your support. I saw what you wrote. I really appreciate that. And I think that that's the kind of message I'm glad is out there now, because I think this is the perfect time to return to the theaters. If you're vaccinated, if you feel to go so safely, and again, don't put your health over no. a narrative, but I think this is the perfect uh, movie to kind of return to theaters with. So I'm excited. Yeah, no, being in the theater for this, it felt big. And, you know, I, I, I've turned down a few things before because I'm like, I'm vaccinated, but I'm also like, Hey, we've gotten into such a habit of like, don't do something with other people. And granted, I, you know, I saw it in a way that people are not going to get to see it. That's, that's, yeah. but you know, if, if people are comfortable, it, it is an experience that I sit in there. You remembered why you love movies. There's something about it being gigantic and being surrounded by something. And if you're holding a popcorn in your hand or just like you had to go and like, you know, I listen, there was nothing wrong with having things come to you for a year. Like some movies got way bigger profiles than they ever would have. But I agree. I mean, here's my here's my thing. And this is my my kind of a pitch to, to people that are, you know, trying to wait. Are they going to wait? Or are they going to go see it? The reason that I think theaters are so important. Listen, I have a huge screen. I have a hundred inch TV. I've got surround sound. I've got the best. You know, I've got a completely dark room. Um, but the reality is, is that when I am in here, I'm distracted. I'm on my phone. Yeah. My dogs are walking around. My kids are coming in and screaming. I hear doorbells going off. I pause the movie. Mm-hmm. And um you know, even in the best circumstances, there's a distraction. And I, I think that, you know, being able to sit in a theater with like-minded theater goers and not be distracted for those 90 minutes and let yourself escape is uh, not, nothing beats that. Nothing. Sure. And as we wrap up, super underrated thing that a movie theater is, you watch the credits because you're- Oh yeah, you're, you're, you, you, exactly. And I think that's something else. I was watching the credits of Saw 3 yesterday, four, and- um, you know, you forget about how many people it takes yeah. to put one of these things on. I and mean, with thousands and thousands and thousands of people are working on this in, in the hand that they had and actually creating it. And it's, it's crazy because like I said, it's the, it's the small people, not small, but the people that you don't know's name that are literally creating the things that fans will love and get tattooed on their body so much. Oh yeah. Um, that, you, you know, know the, the bear trap is like one person in the narrative of salt, maybe two, maybe three, depending on what movie you're watching. But like, that's a, that's a team. That's 20 people. That's 30 people. We're making that, that, that item. I know. And, uh, you know, that's so, so I, I hope that, you know, I, I look forward to when I'm 70 years old and we can do the retrospective and bring everyone back on stage and talk about just the family that made these films because, and that's the, you know, the last thing it, it was great about coming back this time because there were so many familiar faces coming back into it. And I think that's why the Saw films have succeeded while the franchises don't. There is a continuity to it. You know, even if we're rebooting the franchise or recreating it, there's a continuity, be it the writers of Jigsaw, or me, the director, or Dan Hefner, the producer, there is a continuity. Uh, and it's just not something that's changing hands constantly. No, and it speaks to the, the material that you guys can have. Like you said, people have never been involved in the franchise. People have made a movie that you admittedly like had a couple of issues with. You know, you made the broad spectrum of, of, of the films. You know, there's something to be said for, there must be something here if all of us can you know, have made very different things come together, make this it's different, but also really feels like it's the same thing. There's, there's, there's some special sauce there that I'm, I'm delighted is back because it's, you know, there, there's, there's so many bad horror movies that when you get a good one, you want to just like, you know, you want to shout about it. Well, thank you so much. I truly appreciate it. My pleasure, man. Thank you for doing this again. Nice awesome. Thank, thank you. you so much. Bye.